simple yet amazing advice which comes directly from the examiner. In the video, I'm going to teach you these eight things. And these techniques in the method all come from the examiner's own answers to the questions in the June 2019 paper and the November 2018 paper. So the chief examiner has a cunning plan to make sure that whoever's marking this wants to give you a top grade from the very first sentence. And it's this. Start with an opening statement which considers the ending or the writer's final viewpoint, which of course you will find at the ending. Well, let's see how the examiner's done that. At the end of source A, the writer realizes. So this is the writer's viewpoint, which you get when you get to the end of the source. And if you start with that at the beginning of your answer, you're showing the examiner that you're writing about the whole source. And remember, the whole source is in the question. Let's look at the year before. The underlying moral view in source A is that blah, blah, blah. So they've read to the end of the source and then put down what they think the final writer's viewpoint is. And there are two ways of doing that. First, you could read the whole source and then write your summary statement at the beginning, as the examiner's done here. Or you might think, well, it's going to take me too long under exam pressure to work all that out. So you could just leave a gap at the beginning, write your answer as you go through it, and then you will fully understand the text once you've come to the end of your answer. And you think, okay, now I can go back and fill in that gap and put this summary statement which talks about the whole text. Choose one of those methods, try them out, see which works for you. Technique number two is much easier. Write the first paragraph about source A, and then the second paragraph about source B, to make sure that you are always comparing. And this is what it looks like. You begin with at the end of source A, and then for your next point, whereas in source B, the writer anticipates the danger, but blah, blah, blah. Or you begin with source A, this deadly serious tone is contrasted in source B with the writer's blah, blah, blah. Now, you don't have to do this, of course. You can write about all of source A first, and that can take, you know, a side of A4, and then you can go on to write about source B next. That's the method that I use in the exam because I know that I'll be able to do that. I've got the skills I should do. I'm an adult. But if you're under pressure in the exam, it makes sense to put your comparison in straight away because then that meets that criteria of the mark scheme. You won't end up with an essay that doesn't compare properly, so you'll always get the marks even if you run out of time. Technique number three, use connectives which make you compare. And I mean, they force you to do it. If you use these words, you will definitely get great marks, such as in contrast and whereas. Let's see how the examiner does it. In 2019, the examiner used whereas and but, and in November of 2018, they had contrasted and in contrast. And we see this pattern in June 2018 and November 2017 with whereas, however, but, however, and in contrast. So you can see that at the beginning of your answer, as well as all the way through, you want to be using these connectives because one, it forces you to make the comparison and therefore get the marks, but it also forces the examiner to say, tick, they're making comparisons, I'm going to give this really good marks. Number four you probably shouldn't need reminding of, but I don't know, and it's this skill, always embed your quotations. Now this also has a knock-on effect for trying to persuade you not to use P paragraphs, which I will explain towards the end of the video in case that makes your head explode. Anyway, embedded quotations, let's see what they look like. Well, here they are highlighted in yellow. We'll look at a couple but the principle is you just pick the shortest quotation you possibly can to prove your point, and then you drop that into your sentence so that 
the sentence still makes sense. Let's check out 2 to see what I mean. At the end of source A, the writer realises, with the benefit of hindsight, that they had become complacent about potential dangers. So you can see the quotation makes sense in the sentence. Walker uses the imperative form of the verb in the final paragraph, remember that these are human beings, to command readers to change their minds and their behaviour. Again, you can see how it fits into the sentence. Ideally, the easiest way to do that is to make your quotations one word long, but if you can't, you can see that there are quite a few which are two words long or three words long. Always make them just the right length to make sense inside the sentence. This doesn't just make your writing more academic, it also speeds everything up because you can say more with less and under time pressure it means you can write more, get more marks. Technique number five is to always comment on the emotive language. You will always get that in the exam, 100% guaranteed, but you'll also have some other technical features of language which I've given the acronym VARS, I'll show you that in a minute, so they will always come up. Because remember in this question you're always asked to compare the methods the writer uses, so it's worth having just a few which you know will come up every single question. So that's where my mnemonic VARS comes in, V stands for verbs, A stands for alliteration, but also you will always get some sibilance which is really handy, S stands for simile, but of course the other figurative language is metaphor and personification which happen nearly as frequently, and the final one, emotive language. So if you know you're going to the exam just looking for those, you can have high confidence they'll be there, and also you don't have to revise loads of other stuff. You just have to be good at spotting these and then saying what the effect is when the writer uses them. And if we check out the words in green, you'll see where the examiner has put them straight into their answer, and their favourite one, emotive language, towards the beginning of their answer, in 2019, and emotive phrase, the beginning of November 2018. Then we have a simile here. In June 2018, alliteration and metaphor were highlighted, and in November 2017, metaphor was again highlighted. Now remember, these are only part answers, so the full techniques in VARS, I promise you, would be in the full answer. And that's a really easy way for you to say to the examiner, look, I've got a range. And every time you get a range, you get really high marks, unless your range is like a barbecue, in which case you just get meat. Now you can get top marks just commenting on VARS, but there is one secret source of writers, if you like, which is contrast or juxtaposition, basically the same technique with two different names, and if you spot that, it's really easy for you again to show a range and for you to score quick points. Now I'm going to show you quite an interesting pattern here. So in 2019, the examiner didn't focus on contrast and juxtaposition as the skill of a writer. In November 2018, the examiner concentrated on both. In June 2018, no mention of contrast or juxtaposition, but in November 2017, the technique of contrast is written about. What does this tell you? It tells you that if you do write about contrast, the examiner will automatically think you're a genius and want to give you a grade 8 or 9, because it's something that the examiner themselves rarely puts into their model. They obviously think this is super difficult, but it isn't. Practice it and you'll get it. Now you may have a question such as this. Mr. Salis, can I write about other methods if I see them, even though they're not in VARS? Yes, of course you can. I'm just telling you the techniques in VARS to prove to you that they will always be there, so they'll be easy to find, and writing about them only will still be enough to get top grades. But if you spot more, write about them. Number seven is a really cool hack. So how do you persuade the examiner that you've written about the whole of the source? Well, you deliberately mention the opening, or the start, or the ending, to prove to them that you're thinking about the whole of the source, and you write the phrase, the whole of the source, if you want. Notice that the writers don't name the middle. 
And that's a top clue that writing about the beginning and the ending is much more important than writing about the middle. So if you're pressed for time, write about the endings at the beginning, write about the beginnings later on, and then contrast that to the endings. And if you have time, include the middle. But if you don't have time, hey, don't worry. You will already have proven that you can write a brilliant comparison analysing the whole text. This is how the examiner did it. At the end of source A is followed by the opening comment in source B and then the start of the extract. In 2018, the examiner began with the final paragraph and then contrasted that to the opening paragraph of source B. A cunning way to prove that they are doing the whole of both sources. I've deliberately placed my head directly below the word perspectives. There it is. That's what the whole paper is about and that's why this question focuses on it. And therefore tip number eight is use the word perspective or viewpoint, which means perspective, or tone, which is a product of perspective, to prove to the examiner that you're writing about perspective. That's why I wear them. Gives me a great perspective. Never mind. So in June 2019, the writer realises perspective, tone, suggests he feels, he being the writer. In November earlier, view, tone, the humorous, almost frivolous tone, irony and perspective. Three words that are easy to use to force the examiner to give you top marks. And if you think about it, it would be impossible for you to use those words and not write about the writer's perspective. So they really, really help you. Now, if that made sense to you and you're thinking, give me more, Mr. Salas, here is the bonus content, five things that will make your writing even better for this question. Tip number one, you can compare both texts at the beginning, find a similarity in the beginnings, but then whap the examiner with a butt. So we see this when examiners were more ambitious nearly four years ago. Both writers admire the surfing, similarity, but. And structurally, both texts open with a but. So if you are able to read both texts and then open with this kind of summary similarity, you can follow it on with the but brilliantly. Bonus feature number two is that instead of just comparing both texts in the whole, of your writing, you can do that in one sentence. This is a bit of a mega technique. Let's see what it looks like. I've highlighted it in yellow and green so you can see how the examiner achieves this. Both writers admire the surfing, but whereas in source B, Bird appreciates the surfing display as a spectator from afar, then comes the contrast to the other text in the same sentence, Doyle in source A is dazzled and desperate to take part, blah, blah, blah. The same happens again. Structurally, both texts open with a view of the surrounding area, derelict in source A and squalid in source B. But, here comes the contrast, giving Finn the opportunity later to contrast and highlight the achievements of the school, despite the disadvantages. Again, just one show-off sentence. Don't do this if you're not able to punctuate sentences brilliantly because you'll crash and burn. This is an advanced technique, but easy to do when you know how. Bonus method two also gave you bonus method number three. You're comparing both texts in the same sentence. Now, do you remember I told you about not needing P paragraphs because they get in the way? This is why. You can link more than one quotation in the same sentence if you stop writing P paragraphs and write P sentences. Let's check that out here. Bird uses a repetitive pattern, that's my point, to suggest she sees the world of surfing as a paradise of endless bliss. That is my explanation, not where you'd normally expect it in a P paragraph. And so blue, so soft, so sweet, that is my evidence. Now, instead of starting a new P paragraph, the examiner is going to carry on with another P sentence. The alliteration adding to the slow and soothing, that is the point. Serene is the evidence. 
and tone she creates is the explanation. So we have two points in yellow, two explanations in blue green. I'm colorblind, what can I tell you? And two lots of evidence in green. I definitely know those are green. And all that is in one sentence. It's dynamic, it's quick, and therefore you can write more of them and gain more marks, which is why P paragraphs are bleep or if you prefer an anagram of a famous fish. So this is also bonus feature number five, where you link more than one point in the same sentence. And why this is such a brilliant skill on top of your language exam is that it works fantastically well in literature as well. Two wells, good if you're thirsty. Now, if you would like to see a really easy exam walkthrough using some of these methods, that video is coming up now. Or is it now? That video is coming up now. See you soon on my channel.